what we tend to do, uh, James, is start all of our conversations with the same question. What is high performance? For someone as phenomenally successful as you, after all the years you've been enjoying that success, have you got a definition for high performance? Yeah, it's Tesla, man. You go from uh, zero to uh, 60 in 2.2 seconds on the... Uh, <laughs> that's yeah I, yeah I mean look I, I don't I don't I don't come from the same place as a lot of people I don't think about it um, I don't work for a living I play for a living somebody said you're lucky if you find something you like to do in life and then it's a miracle if somebody will pay you to do it and that's kind of my gig I don't think about it at all um, I I consider it to be uh, I consider myself to be lucky I grew up in a little town in upstate New York on the river and I still see the world through that. So I get a kick out of this stuff. You know, I, I do a couple of books with President Clinton. This is cool. I, I hang out with them. Very interesting. I know Trump. Trump, Trump and Clinton used to play golf together, which is hilarious. <laughs> At any rate, uh, yeah, so I don't, you know, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question or avoiding it or whatever, but I don't, I don't think about it. And I never have. I do a lot of stuff. I stay busy. Um, I find that I'm, I think I'm doing the best work I've ever done right now. So I'm probably just delusional. So. Well, can I jump in there, James, <laughs> and quote to you, like in your brilliant book, um, that's, that is just filled with stories. One story that jumped out to me was the, was when you met Walter Sullivan, who, who told you that you, that you have a gift. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah. you say that you don't think about it, but. Other people have obviously spotted it. What is it you think that gift is? Well, the gift for writing, I mean, this. Uh, I, I have an autobiography coming out, obviously, James Patterson by James Patterson, very modest title. <laughs> um, and Walter Sullivan uh, was a um, professor I had at Vanderbilt uh, Graduate School. Um, and um, he just, he read a bunch of my short stories and he, and he just he just felt, what's, what is that gift? I don't know. It's, I mean, for me, um, I, I like to pretend that I'm, that I could keep this thing in my ear, but obviously I can't, um, that I'm, 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 I'm telling a story to somebody's one person sitting across from me. I, I have this in the autobiography. I don't want them to get up till I'm finished. So that's always been a piece of it for me. I don't want to be boring. I want to tell a story. I mean, I'm being boring, but I don't, I don't want to be. And if I could write this, I could write it better than I could talk it. But, um, uh, but Sullivan saw that ability to, to create, you know, in the autobiography, um, I, I haven't led that exciting a life uh, compared to a lot of people, but the, this autobiography is a lot more interesting than some people who have led really interesting lives. Um, but I just know how to tell a story better than they do. You know? And what was the impact of that though? Like when, like we often talk on this podcast, James, around this, what Sigmund Freud called the golden seed moment where somebody yeah. recognizes that gift in you. What was the impact of that on you? Nothing. I knew it already. You know, my, no, my grandmother, uh, you know, she, um, she basically said, you know, you can do, you have, you got it. You got a big IQ. You can do whatever you want to do. So you got to figure out what you want to do. She said, I could not play basketball in the NBA. So, so forget about that. And, um, uh, so she just drilled it into my head that I could, I could accomplish what I felt like accomplishing. And then, you know, I, I did, I, it seemed to me to make sense to, to do something that I like to do. And I, and I, I, uh, uh, I started writing and, uh, and I loved it. Uh, and I, and I said, well, I, somehow I want to try to figure out how to do this, you know, make a living out of it. And, and then side stuff, you know, I'm sorry. No, go on, carry on. Yeah, no, I, you know, in the beginning I was, I was in advertising and I, I wound up running um, uh, J. Walter Thompson North America, which was about 65% of their business. And I was still fairly young. I was in my thirties. Um, and I, I don't know why I was good at that. I, I think part of it is I have a sense for what's going to move people and what isn't going to move, move them. Um, there is a, a thing in, in, in the book, there was a, a guy there uh, an account guy who in the beginning, he couldn't stand me because I was a young and I was a little arrogant or whatever. But I thought I kind of within reason knew the answers to stuff. And eventually it's Southern guy. And he came up with the line. He said, uh, uh, if Patterson says a grasshopper can move a plow, hitch up that little motherfucker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny line. <laughs> Great line. Yeah. 
and look, it's easy to throw away. I, you know, I became the CEO at 38 of J. Walter Thompson, North America. Yeah. The reality is to do that, there needs to be incredible hard work. There needs to be real self-belief. There needs to be dedication. And, and, you're and you got to run and you got to run over people. You got to run over your competition and you got to kill them. Explain no. that. No, no, no. Come no. on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You, you know, I mean, the advertising, the nice thing about it is it, it, it's, it's quantifiable. You think something's going to work and you have to keep delivering. And if it doesn't work, they go, you know, you're full of it. Uh, you're wrong. You're just wrong again and again and again. And uh, so it, it was relatively easy for me because I, I had a pretty good idea of, you know, I, there's a piece in the book. Um, I used to, um, when they bring the trainees in and I would stand up in front of them in a room and I said, I'm going to teach you how to make a million dollars a year in advertising. In those days, a million was, was decent money, no more. And now I have to say, I'm going to teach you how to make $10 million a year. Um, and I said, it's very simple. And, and, and I had somebody and they brought up a cream pie and I, and I held it in my hand and, and then I invited somebody up from the audience and I'm holding the cream pie and looking at them and, you know, whatever. And the, everybody's expecting I'm going to cream. And I, but I gave it to the other person and I said, hit me. And they put the cream pie in my face and I've got the cream pie all over my face. And I said, here's the secret in terms of advertising. You got to hit them in the face with the cream pie. And while you got their attention, you got to say something smart. The end. That's it. There's nothing else. No cream pie. It doesn't work. Nobody paid attention. Nobody heard your message. Cream pie. That's the start. The second part is in, okay, now what are you going to tell them? You got their attention. You can say something stupid and they, they, or you don't, they're not going to remember, you know, who the hell brought them the message, et cetera. So, you know, and a lot of times it's, it's coming down to this. What's the simple principle? What's the core uh, of whatever it is, what's the core to writing thrillers and what's the core to writing kids books or, you know, you're going to make a pitch to President Clinton on why he should, you know, write books with you or, you know, why should he? I don't know. I can think about it and figure out what's the most persuasive argument. Dolly well, Parton. Tell us how then, then, James? So like if you go into that Clinton example, then how did you pitch to him? Um, I, I knew that um, that he loved uh, mysteries anyway. And I knew that we have the same lawyer and I knew that the lawyer had been trying to get him to write something. And I said, look, I, I, I'm convinced that, and I think we have the same goal here, which is at the end of the process, we want to look at this book and go, we're really glad we did this. You know, I think both of us at this point, neither one of us want to do something where at the end of it, you go, yeah, we made some money, but it sucks. Um, and, and that was compelling to him. One, he, you know, I knew he liked mysteries and I reminded him of that. I said that it's going to be as much work as you want it to be. It can be a lot of work. It can be a little work. It's all up to you. I mean, I have a famous athlete that I'm talking to right now. I don't know if we're going to do it or, but it's the same, same notion. Uh, um, it, it can be, you know, we're going to do something good. Um, um, in this case, it'll be, um, um, TV and, and, and maybe it may be a novel at some point. It's going to be good. You can, you can, you can give me as much as you want. I want the authenticity for sure. I mean, that was the other thing with Clinton and even with Dolly to some extent. A lot of thrillers, and I've done this. You're making stuff up, okay? <laughs> with Clinton, there are some things that are a little over the top. Although in this day, it's hard to say that anything is over the top because it seems like anything can happen. But, but, but it was like, okay, if this happened what would the secret service actually do? You've been in the car. What, you know, what would they act, you know, step by step? Or if this thing happened, if, you know, if the president had to disappear, which is unlikely uh, uh, and hard to do, let's lay it out how this could happen. You know, so you had the authenticity there, which Hollywood loves. Um, and the same thing with Dolly's book, the authenticity of eh, not even so much country and Western, but just the music scene. How does it happen? How does somebody break in? How hard it is? You can have all the talent in the world and not make it in that business. So how did you establish a relationship then with somebody like Bill Clinton? Where like, I don't know, We have a lot of the- laughs. Yeah, we have, we have laughs. They trust me. Uh, I'm quick. Um, we don't mess around. You know, uh, my grandmother had a couple of lines. She always wanted to go, ch- go chop wood. And, and she had another line, hungry dogs run faster. Um, and Dolly's like that. And so is Clinton to some extent. I mean, they're both like, I mean, let's do it. Let's, let's rock and roll. Let's get it done. Bill talks a little bit more, but 
Um, and, 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 and we've become friends, which is great. I mean, you want to, you're going to work with somebody over a couple of years. You want to be, you know, Clinton uh, for, for Christmas, what did he send me this year? Uh, Monopoly for socialists. You know, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Let me pick up uh, on something there then, which is yeah, hungry yeah. dogs run faster. Yeah. You're now in your 70s. Yeah. You've had phenomenal success. You mm -hmm. have sold millions and millions of books. No one's mm -hmm. sold more around the world. Why mm -hmm. are you still a hungry dog? Uh, because, uh, as I think I said, I don't work for a living. I play for a living. I'm playing, man. I'm not working. This is fun. I mean, this thing is kind of fun, too. I mean, you guys suck at it, but, you know. No, it's, it's um, <laughs> no, you're not. You're very good. But it, it's, it's fun. Um, and, um, and, and why would I not want to do that? You know, it's like uh, you can eat ice cream, as many hot fudge sundaes as you want to. Okay, <laughs> I'll do that. And, I, you know, and as I said, I think, and I don't think I'm deluding myself, but I think I'm better than I was 10 years ago. I think actually writing the autobiography focused me a lot. I think that was really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, you know, what I've been doing since then, I think is better. And the autobiography, that's a tough, that's tough. You're going to, you know, take your own life and, and make it interesting and tell these little stories and keep people uh, involved. So challenge. And, and I like to, and also challenges, you know, okay, we're going to try that. I, you know, tried fiction, you know, with the first, with the Jeffrey Epstein book, and then uh, got one coming on, on uh, Diana and, and, and the boys, Diana and sons, which is different. And that's a key thing too. I mean, there are a lot of her, her as princess, this is her as mother. And the boy said about her, she's the best mother in the world. And, and so that's a different look at Diana. And that's another thing that I'm, I'm pretty good at going like, hey, who, who needs another Diana book? We don't need another Diana princess book at all, but a mama book that's different. That's could be interesting. And, you know, um, so like that. Can I, can I pick up on, and that's when, the core th when I talked about the core, that's what I thought the, the key to the Diana thing It's Diane and sons. That's, that's the, that's the real message. That's the hook. That's the get people involved and, and then deliver it to them. I mean, I don't want to just, you know, lie about something that is accurate. That'd be bad. There's a good story there, there for people who are listening to this about finding something that's different to everybody else. And, and we have so many people listening to this podcast, James, because they're either a bit lost or they're a bit confused or the one thing they can't find is their passion or their reason for being. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What advice would you give them? You know, in terms of the writing or things like that, I mean, if, if you're, if you're an addict, you're not going to be able to help yourself. So that that's just going to happen. Um, I think part of it is, and we certainly try to do this with our son, Jack's 24 now. And all we would try to do is just keep opening doors and, and just stay open to stuff. Stay open, stay open, stay open, open the door, check that. Don't just sit there and assume people do it all the time. Oh, I wouldn't like to do this. I, I got this when my best friend is a teacher and he would have been great in business, but he always said, ah, I'd be, I, I wouldn't like it. I wouldn't like it. And then after he was a teacher, he did some some work with some businesses. He said, you know, I kind of like this shit, you know, and because he never opened the door. Uh, and, and that's a thing. And, and we just can't sit back. And, you know, we read an article or whatever. We know somebody who does something. Well, I wouldn't want to do that. No, reach in, mess around with it. Uh, you, you might surprise yourself. I did not. You know, I was um, my parents or my mother was a teacher. I was a good student because I didn't. I wanted to get out of a little town that I was in, but uh, but I didn't like it. I didn't like school at all. I didn't like. I didn't. I didn't like to read when I was a little kid, and uh, uh, so I closed that door. And then when I I worked at a mental hospital, worked my way through college, and I had a lot of nights, and so I started reading like a mad person, all serious stuff, not not the crap that I write. I'm just kidding, um, and um, and I liked it. But I, I turned it off. So I, 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 I went, I went, in a million years, I didn't think I'd be a writer. I, I closed that door stupidly. So how, so how do you go about opening doors then, James, now? And what advice gotta, would you give to listeners? No, you, yeah, you got to read stuff. You got to talk to people. Talk to people. You think you want to be a lawyer, whatever the hell it is, talk to a bunch of lawyers. What do you really do? It's not like the TV show. What really happens? <laughs> and, and, and am I going to like that? I mean, that's one of the things that people do. Like, oh, I want to make some money. Yeah, that's true. But how are you going to do it? You know, um, our son now, he's, he's, he's in banking, and I'm sort of scratching my head a little bit because he could do anything. Um, but um, uh, am I going to like doing that? 
you know, if, if you have the luxury of being able to, you know, hopefully, you know, support yourself and do something that you like to do. See, um, there was an intriguing. But I think the main thing is you just, you know, and part of it is, I mean, just keep, you know, checking stuff out, reading stuff, talking to people, blah, 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 blah. And uh, until something starts and, and maybe it might not. I mean, you know, as I said, uh, um, you know, the secret of life is finding something that you love to do. And then, and then it's a miracle if somebody will pay you to do it. That's the other piece of it. It may be that you, you have to do your day job and, and your real passion is, is what the hell you do when you go home. You know, you're 280 pounds and you're a ballet dancer, probably not going to get into the ballet in London, but that doesn't mean you can't do the ballet when you come home. And it, and it could be very gratifying. You know what I mean? So sometimes that's the way to do it. Or, you know, I didn't immediately, I didn't have the guts to go off and just write novels. So I worked in advertising and I wrote novels on the side and somehow that balance was fine. And I kept getting better as a writer um, and I was paying the bills, you know. So would you tell us about that early experience then? Because in, again, in, in that autobio, uh, in the autobiography you wrote, you like your work ethic of investing that time early in the morning before you went to the advertising agency. Would you tell us a little bit around that? Yeah, well, the, that was the play lesson. ethic because, uh, uh, you know, I'd get up early in the morning, but I wanted to. I desperately wanted to. I mean, when I went into work at 830 or something, I felt I'd already accomplished great stuff because I'd been writing for a couple of hours. I really felt, you know, and, and if I had the opportunity at, at lunchtime, I'd close my door and write for half an hour. Or if I was on a plane ride, yeah, great, man, I'm writing, <laughs> you know. So, don't you know, you just don't waste any time. And, you know, like a lot of people when they get older – they don't know what to do with themselves. I always know what to do. If I have free time, I don't, if, if, if I get one of those periods, you know, in the, at the end of the day, I'm going, I don't want to do it. I know what to do with myself. I come up here and write some more. And I love it. It's not work. I, yeah, I'm very lucky. I, I mean, let's face it, it's, it, it. I lucked into it. But, you know, if I, if I hadn't accidentally opened that door, I wouldn't have lucked into it because I wasn't a huge reader. And, and I, I didn't think of myself as a writer. And, um, you know, and, and then, and then I, I figured out, like, what are my strengths and weaknesses? And you, you try to max out your strengths and minimize your weaknesses. And, and that's true in pretty, pretty much anything. I mean, whether you're a, a football player or, you know, okay, what do I do? And, and to be honest about it and, and, and uh, you know, improve what you can. You know, I, um, um, when, I, when I finally made it big, like with uh, Alex Cross books, I sat down and I go like, okay, what am I good at? What am I? And I, I decided I was going to write in those books, both first and third person. So Alice, his sections are all in the first person, but I can, but I can also write third person, you know, in terms of the villains or whatever other subsidiary characters in the book. So I could make, I could make use of, of my strengths and my weaknesses. That's another important thing. And for people to be honest with themselves and, and yeah, don't worry about it. So you got some flaws. So what, who doesn't? So you described that, like you were talking about doing that inventory of your strengths and weaknesses and, Again, you speak about that period of your life working in the psychiatric hospital that you yeah. say helped you to develop empathy, which has obviously been a great trait in your writing. Would you tell us yeah. about how, how you developed that and why it was so important? Um, yeah, I, part of that, I think there was a seed in, in, in terms of my family. Um, they, you know, I mean, they had their pluses and minuses. I mean, I think both my parents had drinking problems. But they were basically good people. And, um, you know, they they recognized, um, you know, I, I, I've been poor and I was middle class and then I was poor and middle class again. And now I'm very well to do and on balance, I prefer being well to do. Um, but I'm really glad that I went through poor and middle class uh, because it taught me a lot about understanding people and understanding that. You know, there are a lot of people with not a lot of money around that are a lot more. And I think they're smarter. A lot of people I know who didn't really have much money, they're smarter than the people I see here in Palm Beach who have millions and billions of dollars. You know, some people, they just luck into shit. When they don't realize it, they're like, they think they're, you know, God's gift, but not always the case. Um, you know, so, I mean, and, and I think, you know, being exposed to, well, you know, my father grew up in a Newburgh poorhouse. Uh, uh, so it was, that's kind of like being homeless. His mother was a charwoman there and, um, they got some little room and, you know, so that was a part of the background. It's not like I take any medals for that, but you know, it, it, it gets you thinking about stuff. And, 
uh, and you recognize that, uh, you know, you, 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 you need to be lucky. And, but in particular, uh, you just need to have respect for people. I have great respect for people that, that, that work for a living. And I always want people to understand better. You know, I, I do in a series of books and they're not really that big in England. They should be because they're really good. But like the first one was called walk in my combat boots. And, um, uh, I wrote it with this guy, a friend of mine from down here, uh, Matt Eversman. He was the, you know, the movie Black Hawk Down. He was the actual sergeant in the movie. And I saw him interviewing some, some military people one time. And I said, this guy is great at it. Because a lot of times military people, they don't want to talk about what happened, you know. And, and he was great at getting people to talk, the military. So I said, let's do a book, man. And, and our mission was at the end of the book that people who had been through it, military people would say, Eversman and Patterson got it right. And other people would go, you know, I thought I understood the military. I had no idea. I was just deluding myself. Uh, and then we did one with ER nurses. And I go, oh, we love nurses. Man, if you realize what they do on an hourly basis, it's like, how do they not go crazy? You know, you talk about PTSD or whatever. I mean, it's like, it's just one thing after the other. This curtain and the kid lost his arm and this curtain and the old lady has it having a heart. You know, it's like, how do they do that? But, but the, what I loved about it is at the end of it, um, people would actually understand nurses, you know, like with uh, uh, military, when people go up and they thank people for their service, if they read that book, they would understand what the hell they're thanking them for. And even with the autobiography, I mean, you know, you got Stephen King going, well, Patterson can't write. Well, fuck him. Read the book. <laughs> he actually can write, you know. So, I mean, that's a little piece of it just to change the, you know, the way people perceive different things. Let me just uh, dive in and think, ask you um, about yeah. criticism like that. How yeah. do you deal with everyone having an opinion about your writing? Because again, uh, it's great advice for our listeners no, who maybe struggle with that. It's fine. I don't, you know, it's healthy. It's useful. I mean, you hope that it's just not too, you know, un, unnecessarily nasty. But the, the way the world is now, it's, it's just going to happen. And, and that there's some truth to it. Um, and as long as there is, I'm, I'm cool with it. And, you know, with King, you know, I read a lot of his stuff. I think he's a good writer. What can I say? I'd like to be able to read and go, he sucked. No, he, but he's good. Um, but have and, you had and, to go on and, a, a journey to get to that place, James? I mean, no, 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 no I, okay with criticism and, uh, yeah, good criticism. Yeah, no, I don't, I'm not, I don't suffer fools terribly well. So, I mean, I wasn't a big fan of school. I was, as I said, I wanted to get out. So I was always a good student, but I don't know, even college I found to be kind of a bore. Uh, and I, and I did well, but it was just like, really seriously, dude. I, mean, I don't know. You know, <laughs> graduate school, a little better. You mentioned, uh, uh, you know, Walter Sullivan, whatever, who, who, you know, basically said, you know, you, you can do this, you can do it at a, at a high level. Um, and that was useful, but I, I kind of vaguely knew that anyway. Uh, but it was, it still was, it still was helpful. As hard as teachers work, do you think that schools in 2022 are fit for purpose? Do I think they're what? As hard as teachers work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well-meaning as they are. Do you think that yeah. in 2022, the way we educate our children is is right? Our schools, current modern schools fit for purpose? I, I think it could be a lot better than it is. I think there's, there's too many people at the top making too many rules that don't make sense. You, know, you got to be real about, look, you got kids here. Let's be real. I've got these 20 kids or 30 kids in front of me, and I got to keep it interesting for them. Uh, you know, with the reading, I think it's really important that kids read. Um, you know, I, I have a, a kid's imprint here in America and our mission, I think it's smart and simple, but when a kid finishes a Jimmy book, they'll say, please give me another book. How simple could it be? But in terms of, of, of the books we're going to pick and, you know, whatever, that's the mission. And if we don't think it's, it's a book that kids are going to read and, and we're not, not dumb books, but they're books you read them, you go, that was a cool book. I want another book. As opposed to, at least in this country, millions of kids who say, I've never read a book I liked. That, I mean, that's silly. And why would, and why in schools, you know, look, Shakespeare, I mean, you just can't throw people into Shakespeare. You know, you got to, I, uh, <laughs> I was trying to explain this in some little class and, uh, uh, about Shakespeare. And, 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 I, and I literally stood up in a, in a seat and I said, look, you got to understand like the environment here, like we're in London and it's really weird that there are this many theaters because it wasn't true around anywhere around the world, maybe a little bit in Paris. 
But these theaters are like crazy. I mean, people are drinking and they're loud. And so these actors got to get everybody's attention. So they're going to, that's why I'm going to shout this out, this little thing from Macbeth. I'm going to shout out that first half page. And you got to, that. here's the scene that Shakespeare's got to write for. All these people, they don't want to, they're whatever they're doing and they're kissing and they're drinking and whatever the hell, but he's got to get their attention. So understand that about, you know, now I'm going to tell you a little bit of history just so you vaguely kind of understand. Not too much, just enough so that you, you're not going to get too lost. And the other thing is you might notice around the room here, I put in all these phrases and stuff up on the, on, on the wall, okay? Phrases, words, whatever. Here's the weird thing, okay? And this is a cool thing about Shakespeare. He invented all of these words and all these friends. He literally invented those friggin' words. And if you think about words, everything I'm saying, everything you say, somebody invented that word. Isn't that weird? Somebody actually thought it up and said, this is the word for dog food or <laughs> whatever. Well, you know, pick whatever you want to pick, dog, puppy, whatever. Somebody invented that, you know, but that Shakespeare invented all this stuff. Isn't that cool? So anyway, so I got the kids for the moment and, uh, and, they, and then maybe they'd listen to the Shakespeare stuff. I don't know. But kids, you know, teachers, to some extent, they just got to be real about what we're doing. It just can't be, you got to do this because we're going to do a test and then the state is going to do a test and who cares? So I don't think that's working very well. But then throughout your young but I life, love teachers. My mother was a teacher. We love to, and on this podcast, James, we have a lot of them as well. And, yeah. um, and we, we agree with you. We're, we're big fans of the, the roles that teachers and, play. And the government makes it so damn hard for people. You know, I'm not that necessarily, I'm not saying you're, but my government, let me just, I'll, I'll just pee on them. So, yeah. As are just as bad. Um, I want to, um, I want to keep the conversation about that period in your life. And I want to just roll forwards to when you went to therapy, if you're happy to talk about that. And you write in your brilliant book, you said, my poor dad had his own tough issues and probably felt he was doing the best he could. The year of therapy helped me understand I was lovable, not because I was first in my class, uh -huh, yeah. not because I was as successful as hell, but because I was me. I would love you to talk to us a bit about that because we have. Well, I mean, you've kind of laid it out. I mean, that's yeah, that's the, the reality. I was very lucky in that I, I um, and I wasn't even looking to go into therapy. And I just it was another situation. And I met this guy and he said, well, I wouldn't mind talking to you a little bit. And, and we actually became friends at the I, after about a year, I said, you know, I, I've, I've made some some stuff here and I'm, and I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with it. And after that, we used to go out to lunch like once a month. Uh, uh, and, and as I say in the book, uh, you know, he picked or he picked up the, the bill half the time, I actually picked that up about 30 percent of the time. But, you know, but, uh, it, you know, I um, uh, I didn't feel necessarily that I needed it, but it was really, really useful for me to come to grips with. Um, any anger issues that I have, you know, sit there in a New York cab or something and you get mad at the cabbie for something. You go like, wait a minute, what the hell is that? And, and what I, what I figured through, you know, ultimately was that, um, a lot of that was my dad who used to get real mad and he cursed a lot and stuff like that. And I go, well, that's not me. That's him. <laughs> and, uh, and that was helpful. And, 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 and that notion of, once again, who's the core person? And, you know, I think I'm a, a, a decent human being. I try to do the right thing most of the time. Um, you know, have a sense of trying to be funny, you know, within reason and, and you know, and, and uh, compassionate when it's appropriate. And, you know, I'm going through stuff, you know, in all families now, my sisters are, you know, whatever, you know, some sickness. And so, you know, you got to, you got to, you know, you got you to deal with it. You got to, you know. Um, so I think the family was, was very useful there. And I think the therapy, uh, it was good, you know, for, for, for a year or so. And then some, I'm not saying that it needs to be a year. Sometimes it's less, sometimes it's a lot more than that, so but it was good. Can you share any specific trip, uh, tricks or tips that you picked up in therapy that you still use today then, James? Um, I don't remember anything in particular, but it was just, uh, just a change in my point of view, why I was doing certain things. If I would, you know, if I, if I would get angry about something that was inappropriate, I'd go like, Oh, that's just that thing with my dad. And, and, and also not to blame him. This is my situation, but you know, not to blame him for stuff. He did have, you know, he grew up, as I said, in that, in the, in the poor house and uh, took a bunch of crap in his life and, you know, drank more than he needed to, et cetera. So there were issues with him that, and I'm not going to hold that against him. One of the things, and this was, uh, it's in the book, and um, 
this is also, I think, useful for people to consider. I, I had a, a house down on the ocean um, and uh, I was in advertising and I had to go back one Sunday and I was in the, the Garden State and it was like wall to wall. It was like going like seven miles an hour heading back to New York. And I'm hating it. I'm going like, man, I just left the beach and it was great and the sun was shining. And I'm going to back to do this stupid advertising meeting, which I don't really want to do. I definitely don't want to, you know, leave the shore. And 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 I'm watching. And on the other side of the road, about every 10, 15 seconds, one car would go by. <laughs> OK, and, and and I'm watching and I'm watching and I'm watching. And at a certain point, and this is one of those eureka moments, I mean, literally eureka moment for me, it dawned on me that my life was going in the wrong direction. I didn't need to be in that on that lane going back to New York City to do advertising. I needed to get on the other side of the road, literally get on the other side of the road with those cars that are going by. And, and that was the point where I, I basically said, no, I got, I'm getting out of advertising. I'm going to write books for a living. Boom. Just like that. And I had a meeting a couple of weeks after that with the guy that ran Thompson. And uh, he was saying, you know, you could run it all, the whole world. And I'm going like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I, he said, I don't know if I said this, but he said that uh, 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 one of my lines was, I, 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 I'm, I'm making a, a lot on books now. I can't afford to work for J. Walter Thompson anymore. You know? <laughs> I don't know. whatever. <laughs> but, uh, um, but that thing of, of examining your life somehow, which is really hard to do because we get into these habit ruts, you know? Yeah. Um, and those are dangerous and they're tricky and they're hard to get out of. There was a philosopher, I think it was Locke, and I'm going to, you know, sort of fuck up his reputation with this. But the basic notion was you're in this habit rut and you keep walking it the same way every day. And the rut keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And at a certain point, it's so deep that you no longer can have any stimulation you can't get out, you cannot get out of the rut because you, you're getting no stimulation. And that's, I think, a lot what happens to a lot of us. We keep getting into this rut and we get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And we cut off all stimulation that would get us out of the rut. You know, I, so I think that's describe used- James as the only difference between a rut and a grave is the size of the hole. Right. So, can yeah. I ask you about another? Damascus moment or a eureka moment, as you described it in the book, when your first love, Jane, um, mm. you write really beautifully about that relationship. And yeah, it was one particular moment where you described going into a really posh restaurant and the experience oh. where she said, James, yeah. you belong here. And yeah, it, that yeah, really yeah. intrigued me about imposter syndrome. Yeah. Well, that's, a, yeah, that's, um, uh, I don't, I never know the, phraseology for imposters and stuff like that. But yeah, I was, you know, I'm, I'm from the sticks and, and Jane, um, you know, more of an upper middle class kind of an upbringing. And she wanted to take me to this very fancy French restaurant in New York and uh, which she loved. And um, I, um, uh, I, w- I was uptight because I really didn't know how to operate that well in, in, in this French restaurant. And she, and she was great. She, and she would never make fun. She would never. And, and she did this very privately. So it wouldn't bother people around. And, and she, she'd ordered some stew, French stew, whatever. And she just took her face and she put it down in the stew. And then she came up with all this goop on her face. And she said, look, this is our restaurant. <laughs> this is us. We don't, we don't care about anybody else. And she wasn't, you know, nobody, it wasn't going to bug anybody else. She was very, you know, didn't want to ruin anybody else's dinner. But she made that point of, yeah, that's right. It is. This is our place. We're here. We're not going to bother other people. But, um, and that's important that, that you get comfortable uh, uh, and, not, and not get afraid of uh, whatever the hell it is. You know, I, one of my sisters was, uh, she went through life. She, you know, she really, you know, went from small town to small town, not much money. And, um, you know, I'm in Palm Beach and she's uncomfortable here. And um, and she just married a guy from here. <laughs> and now she's totally, you know what I mean? So she's gotten over it. She's yeah. like, no, I'm, I'm fine. I can I can deal with all kinds of people. 
rich, poor, middle class, whatever the hell, you know. And and that and that's and that's important. Okay, as we go through stuff and we're afraid of, you know, oh my God, well, President Clinton, um, he'll think I'm a dope, you know, whatever, you know. So, what advice could you offer to our listeners then about overcoming that that uh, those fears of not fitting in or not? Being yeah, good try enough? not to give two shits about it. <laughs> Just go through your life. It's okay. You're you're fine. And if it, and if it doesn't work, then who cares? It's you know, it, it's like. Um, uh, I golf more than I should. And, and I get with people and they're always so like, oh, man, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to hit a bad shot. Nobody cares. You're the only person that cares. Nobody cares if you hit a bad shot. We might break your chops, but you know, we're going to make fun of you. But we don't really care. All we care about is what we're – so, you know, just don't care so much. It's just not – it ain't a big deal. People really get twisted up about stuff. And uh, it's not useful. You know, it's just like, you know, what's going on with the Ukraine now – Look, you can contribute. You could, um, and, and there are lots of ways to contribute. You can contribute to small towns there. You can, you know, you could go over there if you really want it. You know, I have a friend who went over, a journalist, older, and he went over to, 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 to you know. But if you're not going to do anything, don't sit there. It's a beautiful day. You know what I mean? Don't beat yourself up all day if it's not going to help. You know, people do that all the time, you know. Uh, like, oh, yes, there's terrible things happening in the world. There have always been terrible things happening in the world. And do what you do, what you can do. And then, you know, yeah, it's a nice day. You know, hey, I'm going to, you know, look at the sky. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to count the clouds for 10 minutes, you know. James, whether it's um, elite soldiers, whether it's current or former presidents, whether it's singers like Dolly Parton, and actors like Tom Cruise, you have spent so much of your life with people who the outside world considers to be incredibly successful, do they still carry these doubts, these imposter syndromes, these fears, these worries? Um, yeah, I don't. Um, the imposter thing, you know, I don't know. Some do, some don't about that. Um, I don't. I, I think at times in my life, I've had a little sense of that imposter thing. I don't think I have it now, or maybe I do, but I, I'm not aware of it anymore. Um. I think with, uh, I, let me get too, not too specific. I think that President Clinton and Dolly both have, you know, a nice amount of confidence in themselves, obviously. Um, on the other hand, I mean, you know, Dolly will always play with the idea of the dumb blonde and she's anything but, you know, she's very, she's very bright. She's very quick. She's really a good business person and, and really, really nice. She, um, at one point when we were uh, doing the book and, and Rolling Stone said, we'll give you a cover. And they said, but we don't want Jim. And she said, no, I, I, I won't go on the cover without Jim. That's just the way she is, which is, which is great. Um, what did that I mean to you? I, it didn't surprise me, but it, it, it encouraged me. I mean, part of it, and I'll get this again and again, because everybody, not everybody, most people love her. And they go, I hope she's like that in real life. And she is like that in real life. You know, she's a character. She's got a fast tongue. She's funny. She's not too full of herself, but she's confident. She's not full of herself, but she's very confident in, in her abilities, which I think is, and I think, you know, President Clinton is similar that way. I think I'm similar that way. You know, we're not, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I think the people, the real imposters are the ones that, you know, like to pretend, you know what bank I'm the president of? Not really. <laughs> Do I give a shit? I don't know. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, every once in a while, and this, I, I really try to bite my tongue. My thing in restaurants is I just want to be treated the way I would expect you to treat all customers, you know? And uh, probably about once a year, you get some shit treatment somewhere and you, and, 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 and you wind up saying, Do you know who I am? And I want to kill myself when I do that. <laughs> You know, it's like, I just want to like, give me, give me the, one of the, do you have a steak knife handy? <laughs> Cause I want to stab myself in the throat because I just said that. Uh, but mostly, no, you don't, you know, no, you're, you're just another person and you hope you're going to be treated the way, you know, why wouldn't a restaurant treat everybody well? I don't get that. Or these restaurants where, you know, where they, they make their whole deal is, is making important people feel important, even if they're not important. And if you're not, you know, they're going to, they're going to let you know. And that sucks. I mean, that's awful. Mm. You know, so don't go to those restaurants. That's a simple, you know. James, uh, can I ask you about what I would consider to be a bit of a superpower that you have, which is you have this sort of detached curiosity that I think from when you described it at the psychiatric hospital and 
even like when you first started in advertising, you were almost like a reluctant outsider into that world because you wanted to be a writer. But I think yeah. there's something really quite powerful for people to understand when it comes to high performance, how you to know, observe. It, it's, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that there are any rules, honestly, other than understanding who you are and following that within reason and maxing your strength and minimizing your weaknesses. But, you know, even when I was in school and it's true now, you know, where we are in Palm beach, we're not in any cliques. I never was in cliques, but I was, you know, in school, I was cool with the nerds. I was cool with the smart kids. I was cool with the jocks, you know, within reason, but I wasn't in the clique. You know what I mean? So I never had to like, I got to act in this click way because this is how all the cool jocks act, you know, or down here. Well, you know, I better get a Bentley because everybody here seems to have a Bentley. I, you know, I don't care if you, Bentleys are beautiful. I don't want one myself, but, but they're really, they're really nice looking cars, but they're not for me. So, you know, no clicks. I don't know. I, it's, it's useful for me. And, and you, know, you said detached. And I think that's a little piece of it. You yeah. know, I'm really impressed with President Clinton, but I'll tell you this a quick. <laughs> so, we, it's in the book too, but it's, it's such a cute story. You know, uh, we went out golfing and, uh, uh, you know, they said, you know, I'll only play nine holes. I said, yeah, great. I don't, I don't care. We can just go in a putting green. I don't, so I'm, I'm happy with that. So we get to the third or the fourth hole and I feel golfer up and he had about an eight foot putt for birdie. And you don't leave short putts short in golf, you know, and he left the eight foot, eight foot putt about four foot short. And I turned to him and I said, you pussy. And he said, you just call me a pussy? I said, yeah. He said, well, you're right. I am a pussy. And that established, I, I don't use the word pussy in the book, but that established <laughs> the two of us as human beings and whatever. And we knew we could talk to each other and joke and he could make fun of me and I could make fun of him. In public, it's Mr. President and blah, 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 which is great and appropriate. You know, at Queen Elizabeth, you know, Whatever. I don't know what you do. I've never met a queen or king, but I would learn. Um, um, yeah. And all of this, James, goes back to one of your early jobs at McLean Hospital, where you said in your book that you learned to handle responsibility responsibly. It yeah. felt when reading that, that that was where you understood the human connection. And that still remains something that's so important. To you yeah. It's like we're losing yeah. a lot of that in the modern world. That was a, yeah, that was a really great experience for me on a lot of levels. Um, one of them was just sanity and whatever, uh, people who have, you know, psychiatric problems. Uh, that was a piece of it. Another piece of it was, um, it was really upscale place. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the people, not all, not all, but a lot of them had money. The doctors were mostly from Harvard. So it was useful for me to experience things that I hadn't experienced because where I grew up, it was very, it was a real small town. And, uh, and this was, this was a big town. And, um, and, and, and plus that opportunity to read things, you know, like I mentioned Jean Genet, you know, Our Lady of the Flowers and stuff like that. We go like, okay, uh, this, this dude is thinking a little differently than me. And, and that's good because, you know, yeah, people have a different approaches and different views of the world. And you don't necessarily get that in a small town where even if they do, they kind of keep it to themselves, you know? But I, I kind of got the impression from that, that you, you learn to value the fact that all jobs can shape your career. And I wonder whether in this world we should take entry-level jobs more seriously and we should all have that open mind that you might not be where you really, really want to be, but yeah. where you are can still help you get there. Yeah, no, and, 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 and also... Um, there's no particular reason that businesses have to get into this habit of just torturing the shit out of people when they're entry level. You know, I mean, there's a certain, yeah, pay your dues within reason, but let's keep it human and, and civilized and whatever. Well, this is the way it was when I, you know, went in there. You hated it, right? Yeah, I hated it. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way, you know, unless, you know, like doctors, man, you know, interns and stuff. I'm in a hospital, man. I don't want this dude to come in here and go, I've been 40, 42 hours in a row. Great. Now get out of this room because I don't want to, <laughs> so I don't want some, I, you know, habit, habit. And, and, and that's one of the things we need to just question stuff. 
hold it. Why are we doing this? Is it relevant anymore? Should this change? Yes, in the medi in, in, in medieval time, you know, memorizing stuff as 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 a way you're going to get into the best college or not, you know, because somebody memorizes. You know, in the Middle Ages, it was useful because shit wasn't written down. You had to memorize. You know? Now we can, we don't have to memorize. That's not really the, you meet a lot of people who are supposed to be so smart. Well, they've memorized a lot of stuff, but then you listen to them, you go, well, they're not really that smart, but they can, you know, <laughs> they can tell you all the stuff that they've read because they've met, you know, because they, they, they retain information, not necessarily. Um, I don't think, you know, the, the only way to, to decide who should go to the best colleges, universities. So can I ask you about, you like you've spoken really powerfully about the influence your family have had on you, James. What, yeah. What, like, what messages and lessons would you hope to pass on to your son, so that when he talks about you, what kind uh, of things you know, would you like him to say? Uh, what a good-looking, sexy guy, and I'm comfortable <laughs> with mom and dad. And um, you know, uh, the opening the door things it was is a huge thing with Jack. Um, um, another piece of it is, and I mentioned this in the book, it's probably not totally accurate, but the first time I remember my father giving me a hug was on his deathbed. And, um, and with Jack, every day that he was here from when he was a little kid and we would drop him off, I give him a hug, uh, you know, and drop him off at school. And he was comfortable with it. It's like, okay, fine. He, he gives me a hug. It's all right. Where I'm used to it. And if the kids go, your dad gave you a hug. You go, yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, trying to be comfortable in your own skin. Um, yeah, a lot of stuff we talked about, maxing out your talents, being, you know, understanding kind of what you do particularly well, what you don't do as well. See, I'll tell you, when he was, he was, you know, he went off to prep school, which we didn't really want him to do, but he wanted to do it. And it was probably an okay. But be, when he was with us, that he was the funniest little bastard in the world. He was so funny and clever. Just, I mean, this stuff that he would, you know, he, he'd be, it, you could have been a writer for Saturday Night Live when he was like 12. And then, and they took the funny out of him in prep school. You know, they just beat it out. I don't know how the hell they did. And all of a sudden they said, Jack, he used to be so funny. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> they used to come at night and they would beat me. No, I don't know what they did, but, uh, you know. Um, but a lot of that stuff, you know, uh, understanding who you are, that core thing, which I think is, is, is vital for people to get to that thing and get comfortable with it. There's a, a woman, a PR woman that we work with in the U S and every once in a while, I just remind her about how smart and, uh, funny and attractive and whatever in a good way, you know, especially the, the smart and, you know, and, and cause she, and she had a boyfriend issue and you know, whatever. Um, um, and, and just that core, just be comfortable with that core. Uh, and as I said before, that little thing of, you know, sometimes it's going to be your avocation that, that gets you through the day. You, know, you just, you know, you have to take a job that, you know, it's not optimum. So it goes, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm lucky. I didn't love, I didn't like advertising too much, to be honest with you. Um, my joke about advertising is I've been clean for over 25 years. You know? <laughs> <laughs> James, we've reached a point in our conversation where we move on to some quick fire questions. Okay, the first right. one of which is the three non-negotiables that you and the people around you need to buy into. Uh, you know, I, I'm just not big on elitism. I'm not big on phonies. Um, I don't know. That's, that's pretty major with me. Um, I, I don't know. That's huge. Two. Two out of three isn't bad, right? So I get a 66. You'll do. It's a D, but you know, what the hell. I think it's also, it's also better if you, the, the, you know, life is so complicated. You have to make it simple. So if you can take three and make it two, or if you can make it one, all to the good. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that so important? Because life is complicated. What, weren't you listening, Jake? <laughs> I was listening, but it's like, I life just want a is, bit more depth in that for people. <laughs> no, they don't need the depth. That's the whole point. The depth, if you come to the right thoughts, the depth is, it's in there. That's how you got to that thought. Uh, but but it, it is complicated out there, and and it is good if you keep you know narrowing it down to something that you can that you can live by. 
Nice. I, I, I'm not big on these like nine rules and I don't know, whatever. It's too, too many rules for me. But at any rate, but three is probably a good number. Yeah. But I don't if you could go back to any moment of your life, what would it be and why? Um, I, you know, I think like everybody, you'd like to be able to, um, whatever wisdom you've gathered, uh, whatever you figured out, um, um, some of the money, <laughs> and, then, and then be 30. That'd be cool. I, I could, I could, I, I think I'd probably get in some trouble though. So it wouldn't be good. And I, you know, Sue is great. I mean, I'm very lucky. Uh, you know, as I say, uh, uh, Sue and I, you know, we go to bed every night holding hands and that's accurate. And, uh, uh, you know, if Sue ever left me, uh, I'm going with her, you know, so that's a, uh, yeah. so that, 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 that's another, I mean, that's obviously another important thing, you know, you know, who you're with and do you need to be with somebody? And a lot of people do. Um, and, 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 and how you, how you find that person, how you, you know, balance off, you know, figure out who the hell you are, what's wrong with you, what's right with you. And, and I think when you find somebody who really is, you should feel like, you know, I, I'm so lucky to have found this person and and I'm not fucking it up. I'm just not going to mess it up. I'm just, you know, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that line because no, (laughs) Not happening. I'm biting it. I'm biting my tongue there. Yeah. How important is legacy to you? Zero. Well, I'm dead. What do I care? I don't, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if it's useful to the family, fine, you know, um, but, but mostly you just want to be, you know, up, as I said, I mean, to some extent writing the book and, and, and I know it's a good book. Um, and I know some of the others that I've written are good. Some aren't, but some, Aren't, aren't very good at all, but you know, half a dozen or whatever, they're, they're good. And the character created X number of characters and you just want people to within reason be fair about it. That's all, you know? So um, right now, um, but legacy eh, doesn't mean anything to me. What advice would you give to a teenage James? Just that. I'm out. not a big advice person. I mean, you know, even I do that masterclass thing and uh, I say, I'm not, I'm not going to give advice. I'm just going to tell you what I do. And you might find some of it useful uh, as a writer but I said, the one thing I will uh, uh, draw your attention to is if you're nodding your head, don't pay that much attention because you you already know that. It's the stuff where you're shaking your head to that you ought to pay attention to and think about because you're not doing that, you know. So I'm sorry, but advice to teenagers? Well, the advice that to your own teenage self, if you could give it to them. <sighs> I, I guess... Um, you know, some of the things that I'm taking for granted now about, you know, confidence, um, you know, being comfortable in your own skin. You know, I don't think I, well, I, I don't think, I don't think I was even close when I was, when I was a teenager. Um, you know, and, and it took, it took, a, it took a while. As you said, part of it was Jane, part of it, you know, my grandmother helped, but even there, yeah, you because know, kids are kids are cruel. <laughs> They're always trying to beat you down and whatever. And uh, don't listen to them. That's you know, I would tell them that you know don't you know don't listen to your uh, to your friends. Don't uh, you know stay. I, I was decent at staying away from the pressure of being in a group or whatever the hell. But uh, you know, yeah. And um, finally, James, your one golden rule for uh, for how to live a high performance life. How would you like, what would you like to leave people with for that? I don't know, man. I think I've said it somewhere in here about 10 different things that I've, I've mentioned one golden rule. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it, it, it just has to come. It, it is the, the, the know thyself, you know, you just, you got to get, you got to be somewhat realistic about who you are and, and go with it. You know, you just, you know, as I, you know, said about the 280 pounds ballerina, you know, probably not going to, I don't know, or maybe you can, but it, it's going to be difficult to, to get on Broadway with it, but that doesn't mean you can't dance. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, what, what, finding that passion uh, and, and, and somehow bringing it into line with, with, with your, your, your skill set, you know, and you can work on the skill set up to, up to a point, you know, James, it's been uh, such an interesting hour to sit and talk to you. <laughs> you are, you're so wise. And I, I get the sort of sense that 
maybe also quite a different person, the one that's sitting before us now to the one that we would have spoken to before you had that year of therapy and you were able to uh, really reflect and become comfortable. Yeah, yeah, it could be for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Are you guys sponsored by a therapist or something? <laughs> <laughs> no, not yet, but you know, we're open to any offers. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thank James. you, guys. A lot brilliant. of fun. Thanks. Enjoyed James. it. Bye. Bye-bye.